Hey everybody, my name is Nick Solero. I am an investor here at Drive Capital and today we are going inside our robotics market map. So let's have a look at the market map by the numbers. We're currently tracking 732 robotics companies around the world. They've raised collectively around $40 billion of equity capital. Uh, we've had the pleasure of having direct one-on-one -on -one conversations with almost a third of them, so over 240 of those businesses. And to date, we've made six investments. So let's zoom out a little bit, better understand why are we looking at the robotics market in the first place. Uh, the concept of automation and mechanization goes back thousands of years to the Phoenicians and the Greeks and the Egyptians. Uh, the term robot is over 100 years old, it was coined in science fiction novels. Uh, referring first to people and later to machines. And you know, for the true robotic nerds in there, you'll mark the 1950s as the date when George Duvall uh, invented the Unimate, was, which was the first industrial robot that you or I would probably think of, or at least picture, uh, when we say, quick, robot, what do you see in your head? And of course, all of us have seen pictures and videos going back to the 70s and 80s of big hunks of machines uh, making things like cars and trucks in Detroit. Uh, and you know, I'd forgive you if that's what you think of as robotic automation today. Something is, is happening. Something about this moment in time, I think makes the robotics market particularly interesting from an investment perspective. In the venture world, we think about why now? What, what is it about this moment in time that makes this company or this market interesting and, and that makes it unique, that it, it couldn't happen, it, it couldn't have been built five years ago, or it, it doesn't need to wait for five years from now. What is it about this moment in time that makes this, of all the places that we could invest, that makes this one of the most exciting places to deploy capital? Um, and I think that, that that is appropriate for where we're at in the robotics market. Simply put, I think the robotics world is moving from motion-driven to mission-driven. And that might sound like a nuance, but I actually think it's a profound change in the way that technology is, in, is intersecting robotics automation. Historically, automation was a function of going waypoint by waypoint by waypoint. And what differentiated uh, a machine from a company like Fanuc, from a machine like, from a company like ABB, to something like a universal robot, was really the hardware's ability to be precise in its motions, the amount of payload that it could carry, so how strong was that robot, uh, and how fast could it act. Um, but underneath, it was hand programmed, going from points in space and time, X, Y, and Z coordinates at certain intervals uh, that really formed the bedrock of industrial automation. This required that processes were highly engineered, that they needed to be exactly replicated every single time. Uh, in order to do that, you would had to have uh, expensive fixturing so that the parts or the components were presented to the robot in the exact same way every single time, time and time again. Oftentimes the robotic hardware might be measured in the cost of hundreds of thousands or maybe a million dollars for, for a given automation cell, but the fixturing, the, the apparatus around it would sometimes be hundreds of millions of dollars. This is why when you picture that industrial robot, you probably imagine it producing hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of units of the exact same SKU. Think your Ford F-150 or you know, pick your fa favorite, you know, cog, uh, if we're going to produce cogs, we need to make many, many, many tens of thousands of them in order for the unit economics to make sense, because you need to amortize the cost of that very expensive, very fixed, highly engineered automation cell over many, many, many parts. Now, however, all of this is changing. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're going from motion driven. So how can we pro program a very specific set of coordinates for a robot to go through? to mission driven. We can give a robotic cell or an automation cell a desired end state, a future version of the world that we would like it to effectuate, and then the robot can do the work of figuring out exactly how it's gonna happen. It does its own path planning. It does its own vision. It can grasp parts at randomly oriented uh, positions. It can come up with dynamic movements on the fly, things that would be far too complicated for a human to manually program and far too variable to uh, support greater skew variety and lower run counts, right? So if the historical automation favored low mix, high volume, 
Now for the first time, we can automate things that are high mix and comparatively low volume because we have this new software enabled flexible automation. And while it might sound nuanced, this is a fundamental shift in the way that we think about automation and I believe is gonna catalyze a whole new generation of companies that are built around flexible automation at scale and really will afford this technology to whole categories of products and parts and things that up until this point could never be automated. So how did we get here? Why now? Why are we able to move from motion-driven to mission-driven? Well, really, it's a, it's a function of a handful of really cool things. Um, first and foremost, sensing capabilities. The ability for machines to understand the context of where they're at in space and time, to see the world around them, to smell the world, to understand vibrations and force and sensors, this is brand new stuff. Ironically, a lot of the investment over the past decade that went into things like self-driving cars, LiDAR, cameras, radar, um, real-time compute, dramatically brought down the cost of those individual components while dramatically increasing the capability of those components. And now the whole world of automation is benefiting from a lot of that upfront R&D that made these things just now accessible to an engineer or a team that wants to turn on uh, a newly capable robot. Simultaneously, the compute capabilities have also gone through the roof. Think about all of that data from all of these sensors that needs to be fused and operated at the same time in near real time in order for a robot to, to act and behave in the real world. You all might not think about robots when you think about Bitcoin, but if you look at the mining rigs, the actual hardware that's used to do all the cryptography that underpins the distributed ledger technologies, GPUs are the compute infrastructure best situated for mining crypto. So as everyone has been trying to leapfrog one another to build the fastest and best crypto mining rig, that research into the GPU infrastructure also is uniquely situated to do things like AI and ML. This is the horsepower that takes all that data off of the sensors and makes it usable again to achieve that mission that we've given the robot. People used to do this manually programming. Now the combination of excellent sensors with dang near real-time compute on top of GPU architectures means that robots can take in the world around them and react accordingly in near real time. Additionally, there's an explosion of low code and no code software tools that make anybody a robotics engineer. And on top of that, today's PhD level cutting edge research, tomorrow can be downloaded and open source. The pace of innovation in this market is absolutely astounding. And things that just a few years ago you thought would be impossible are now commonplace. Match all of this with, with uh, an arms race, literally of robotic arms on the hardware side where you have rapidly decreasing cost of hardware, rapidly increasing capabilities of different sizes and shapes, degrees of freedom. You've got industrial robots from the uh, incumbent players like ABB, Fanuc, Yaskawa. You've got your universal robots coining things like collaborative robots and there is a tool for everything. Finally, labor. Whether we like it or not, due to rising labor rates and decreasing labor accessibility, the economic argument in favor of automating as many of these repeatable tasks as possible is as present and forceful as it has ever been. Okay, so there's 732 companies in our robotics market map. Are we gonna invest in all of them? No. In fact, we're gonna invest in almost none of them because Frankly, we have a very, very tight spec of what it is that we're looking for. So how does Drive Capital think about this market from an investment perspective? And really, how do we think about investing in general? You could look at our website, you could look at our robotics portfolio, you're gonna see early stage businesses, later stage businesses, you're gonna see robotic welding, you're gonna see pure software. And I'd forgive you if you said, well, what the heck? Like, are you guys just flipping a coin or are you throwing darts? What is it that all of these companies have in common? Um, but believe it or not, there is a method to our madness and it boils down to two things, at least two things in the way that I think about it. Uh, the first is, is market size. Market size is our North star. We want to invest in only really, really big markets because big markets make room for big companies and small markets will never yield big companies. And in our business, 
We want to invest in companies and entrepreneurs that have the opportunity to leave that proverbial dent in the universe, poster on the wall sorts of businesses, and that starts with a big market. Beyond big markets though, we want to invest in number one. We want to invest in category defining companies in big markets. So that's those two things. If you look at our website, you will find a list of companies that we believe are destined to become category winners in really big markets. But beyond that, it's not enough to just win the category for this year or for the next two years. What we're talking about are building companies that are durable, that are around 100 years from now. Uh, and that requires an additional something special. That durable category win winning characteristic is hard to find. Uh, it's a function of a moat. It's a function of a network effect. It's a function of something about the technology or the business model that means I'm not just investing in this company because they're the right business at the right time right now, but that they are going to go on and durably win this market for the years to come. At Drive, we are long-term investors. We want to be long-term capital partners for entrepreneurs that aren't working on a trade or that think they can make a lot of money in the next 18 months. We want to invest in companies and founders and entrepreneurs that are going to change the market landscape for decades. And that is hard to find. Your ability to get to market quickly and to capture the imagination of your customers is if you're solving an acute pain point. It's something that they already know that they have. It's you know, irrespective of whether or not I'm calling, that customer woke up this morning going, oh my God, if only there were a company or a solution or a product that could solve this problem because it is so fundamental to me and my business that I would pay whatever it takes to get it. Companies that have unique defendable technologies in massive markets that are solving highly acute pain points, that is where magic happens and it manifests in the numbers. The growth just goes like this because the amount of pull from the market exceeds the, the ability to fulfill it, right? It, it's that sucking sound from the market that you, is when you know that you've got something really special. And ideally, not always, but ideally, the value of that process that you're automating is super, super high. So I know it's not a convenient fact, but we, there is a labor cost curve. And if you have a technology that intersects the labor cost curve at a relatively low rate, the economic threshold that you have, that envelope of value is relatively small. If, uh, on the other hand, you intersect the labor cost curve at very high value labor, obviously the economic envelope is, is much larger. Um, if it's a truly software business or you know, mostly most of the IP is in software, the marginal cost of delivering that solution is almost zero, right? It, that's, the, that's the infinite scalability of software. So if you can have a unique software enabled solution that's intersecting the labor cost curve at a very high rate, that's where you can have a very, very exciting company. So what have we invested in? Our journey down this robotics market map started in 2017 and then our first investment started happening around 2018. Um, our first investment in the robotics market map was a company called Ready Robotics. Um, this is a software company that looks at the historically the existing fragmented uh, robotics landscape that is characterized by really esoteric programming languages. We're talking about command line programming. Um, that is unique to each OEM. Uh, there really was no common platform. Think of, you know, in computer and phones, you've got Windows that sits across the OEMs, or you've got Android that sits across the various makes and models and OEMs to provide a, you know, a single cohesive ecosystem. Uh, that hadn't existed in, in robotics. And so Ready Robotics is the Windows or Android of robots. It's a software operating system that integrates with multiple different OEM providers, all the different peripherals, and it provides one consistent ecosystem for developers and programmers alike to become robotic experts. From there, the momentum really started to, to build up. We knew that we were onto something in this robotics market, and we knew that there was some cutting edge technology that was just coming around the corner. Uh, our next investment was a, in a company called Fifth Season. Um, this is a very ambitious business. So rather than thinking about automating a specific discrete task, Fifth season goes big, right? They are automating an entire process called farming, specifically robotic indoor vertical farming. So their robot 
doesn't have arms or legs. A robot is an entire building. The farm is the robot and it is nothing short of remarkable. It allows the agriculture supply chain to become local. They produce some of the best produce you've ever had in a suburb of Pittsburgh. Think about that for a second. So no longer do we need to take produce from Southern California and ship it to you know, the Northeast for consumption. We can have fully automated robotic indoor vertical farms producing the leafiest, greeniest, most delicious produce next to wherever it is that you live. This fundamentally changes the amount of waste uh, not to mention environmental impact of shipping foods from one corner of the earth to consumptions in another corner of the earth. Once we got our robotic indoor vertical farm fix out of the way, we started looking at like where else, like where are the acute pain points that I mentioned earlier? Um, one of the most acute pain points out there is actually happening in the e-commerce fulfillment and supply chain. Every time you click a buy it now button uh, at Amazon, like think about what needs to happen in order to get that box delivered to your door. It is a modern marvel that happens 24 hours a day, 365 days a year inside of our warehouse and fulfillment network, specifically around the crush of e-commerce. One of the fundamental units in the warehouse is a pallet. Uh, right now, those are highly manual processes that are moving those goods in one door and out the other time and time again. Vecna Robotics has, is a team out of MIT and they have created one of the most advanced, if not the most advanced, self-driving automation stack to enable any forklift, any pallet mover to be fully automated and integrated with the warehouse management system. This increases throughput, decreases cost, uh, and is a total game changer if you're in the business of, of moving things. Our next investment was in a company called Path Robotics. Uh, I mentioned earlier about this notion of replacing really high value, high, uh, you know, highly compensated labor. Um, and in this case, Path Robotics is a truly autonomous welding robot. Now you might be saying, Nick, why are we talking about replacing jobs? Uh, in this case, we're actually filling jobs that aren't currently being filled. Uh, there has been a substantial reduction in the amount of skilled welding labor here in the United States. Um, you don't have to take my word for it. You can Google it all day long and you'll see that there's a massive skills gap specifically around skilled manufacturing. Uh, this was a problem that Andy and Alex, the two founders, lived personally. They grew up in Cleveland. Their dad had a machine shop. They actually were working with these things with their, with their, uh, their hands and their family members. Uh, they went on to become PhDs in things like artificial intelligence and biologically inspired automation. Uh, and they've built the world's only uh, truly autonomous welding robot, and it's nothing so short of remarkable, uh, and their customers uh, would say the exact same thing. So as you can see, we really got cooking on this automation theme, and this is a multi-decade long thesis for Drive, and as is the case with a number of our market maps, like when we go deep, this doesn't just yield one investment or two investments, it yields like entire funds worth of investments. As we got deeper and deeper into automation as a concept, we started to realize that, you know, it's kind of like if you have a hammer and you look around and all you see are nails. Well, we had this amazing automation thesis and all we saw when we looked around the world were, were, were tasks and processes that can and should be automated. A lot of those are in the physical world, but a lot of them are in the digital world as well. And so uh, we started investing in robotic process automation that was purely software. Um, Olive is a company that we're very, very proud of, and they're looking at a lot of the, the inefficient and, you know, frankly, unfun but critically important tasks inside of a hospital setting, things like insurance verification and billing and revenue cycle, all of these things that keep the American healthcare system going but simultaneously make it way more expensive than it ought to be. And Olive is a digital worker that's automating a lot of those tasks and, frankly, having pretty profound impacts on their hospital customers' businesses. Similarly, company Thoughtful Automation looks at you know, all of these different tasks that might be particular to a hospital but aren't, aren't unique. Things like billing and collections and taking data from one software platform that's antiquated and manually entering it into another. These are things that we're, we're paying really smart people to do and they'd rather be spending their time on more creative tasks that are better situated for people, we can automate those with our digital workforce. So that's our robotics market map, and those are the companies that we've invested in so far. But if there's one thing I want you to take away, 
is that this is a core theme for us at Drive. And these might be the current list of companies, but it's not the final list of companies. So if you're a founder, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an investor and you're looking for a partner that is passionate about investing in robotics and automation, give us a call. I'm Nick at drivecapital.com or you can hit up any of the other folks here at Drive. We'd love to talk to you. Mm -hmm.